Good morning, everyone. My name is Joshua Kroll. I'll be chairing this session on uh, online discrimination and privacy. I think this is a fantastic session to follow up on Latanya's keynote. Uh, if we think of the uh, field uh, that we're all here to, uh, to talk about uh, as having started in this research on online discrimination, uh, these are three papers that talk about how online discrimination, especially ad discrimination, uh, works. Uh, there's some theory, some measurement, some explanation of how uh, these technologies are, um, you know, how it's possible to, to govern these technologies. And then uh, the last uh, of the three papers is sort of a position paper laying out uh, some connections between fairness and privacy uh, that should be really interesting. So to get us started, we will have uh, from the Max Planck Institute, Till Speicher, uh, who will be talking to us about the potential for discrimination in online targeted advertising. Uh, and I think this is a paper that does a nice job of marrying sort of real measurement study with uh, some more theoretical work on, uh, on how that discrimination can take place. So with that, uh, I'll take it away. And there will be questions at the end of each uh, presentation as well. <laughs> so, um, welcome to my talk where I will present our work on the potential for discrimination in targeted advertising on the internet. So, um, much of the, much of uh, today's internet economy is underpinned by advertising and in particular targeted advertising. This is one of the features which sets it apart from more traditional advertising media like newspapers or televisions. And in targeted advertising, an advertiser uh, defines the characteristics of his audience and an ad platform then finds the matching users and shows the ad to them. So I will focus on Facebook because it is one of the largest ad platforms and it is an innovator in the field of targeting methods, which then are often adopted by other platforms later. So a problem with targeted advertising is that it introduces the possibility for discrimination. So a New York Times article from 2017 in cooperation with um, ProPublica showed that there, isn't, that there are a number of job advertisements on Facebook that are discriminatory by um, targeting only people of younger ages and excluding people of older ages. And a 2000, an earlier 2016 ProPublica study found that it is possible for advertisers to launch discriminatory housing ads on Facebook. So what they found is that you can, as an advertiser, um, target people who are interested in renting or buying a house, but exclude people with certain ethnic affinities. So uh, for example, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, or Asians. And this is a, a violation of the Fair Housing Act in the US, which prohibits discrimination in housing advertisements based on um, properties or sensitive properties such as um, gender, race, or uh, disability status. And in addition to housing, uh, also the domains of credit and um, employment are regulated. So when faced with a public backlash which followed the revelation by ProPublica, Facebook decided to ban exclusion based on ethnic affinity and several other attributes. And they um, changed their ad policy to explicitly prohibit discrimination and introduced a self-certification process where advertisers certify that they're not launching discriminatory ads. Um, but the question which remains is, can advertisers still target discriminatory ads in spite of these measures? So the con contributions um, that we make here uh, is we uh, study the feasibility of discrimination um, in targeted advertising on the Facebook ad platform. So there are three methods um, which we will investigate. Um, there's attribute-based targeting, there's PII-based targeting, so targeting based on personally identifiable information, and lookalike audience targeting. And we show that all of these methods are vulnerable to discrimination. And um, however, we do not, this is just uh, a focus on 
the, um, on understanding the problem of discrimination, we do not propose solutions uh, to, to solve it. And we also uh, do not investigate the liability questions. So in particular, we do not make judgments about whether the ad platform or a potentially um, discriminatory advertiser, be it um, intentionally or unintentionally, is liable. So before I dive in, I'll give you a bit of background on how discrimination, what discrimination in targeted advertising is. So we suppose we, we have the ad platform, it has an audience of, or it has a population of users, and we assume that this population is divided by some sensitive feature, which could be something like race or gender. So part of the population um, is from one group, the other from another group. And now when an advertiser wants to launch an ad, there is a, what we call a relevant audience for this ad. And this is the set of people to whom the ad is relevant, meaning that if they see the ad, they would interact with it. They would click on it or they would be influenced by it. Users outside of the relevant audience uh, would ignore the ad. And now out of this potentially large um, relevant audience, the advertiser selects a targeted audience through means of, of one of the target processes. And the question now is, is this target, uh, targeted audience discriminatory? So one way to judge this is by looking at its disparity. So here, for instance, two thirds of the blue and two thirds of the red users, of the relevant blue and red users are selected. So we have a disparity of one, so we would not call this ad discriminatory because the fractions match up. However, in a targeting which looks different, uh, this changes. So here we have five out of six blue, blue relevant users being selected, but only one third of the red relevant users. So we have a disparity of 2.5, so this ad would be discriminatory. Now, with this in mind, the, let's look at the first targeting method. This is attribute-based targeting, so there an advertiser defines certain properties of uh, his intended audience, and um, he, um, to, to enable that, Facebook keeps track of about 1,100 uh, created attributes, which span demographic, behavioral, and interest categories, and in addition, there are more than 240,000 what we call freeform attributes, so these attributes are, uh, for example, inferred when a user likes a certain Facebook page. And once an advertiser selects that he wants to target people with some combination of these attributes, then he will be given an estimate of the reach of his ad by Facebook. So this is the, the number of people who match the criteria that, that he specified. And now, if an advertiser wanted to exploit this feature uh, to launch discriminatory ads, then um, for instance, if you wanted to launch a discriminatory housing ad, uh, excluding African Americans, coming back to the um, ProPublica case, then he would choose to <laughs> exclude people um, with attributes that have a high disparity towards African Americans. So for instance, we investigated this for um, the case of a North Carolina audience and found that their attributes um, which are very predominant among African Americans are of course African American affinity. Then we had a, polit um, a liberal political leaning and an interest in online games. So these, all these attributes have a high disparity in favor of, of African Americans. And on the other hand, there are some attributes uh, which have a very low disparity, meaning that the advertiser can select to include people with these attributes because he will not uh, include a lot of African Americans. And now, by now, Facebook has banned some of these attributes, like uh, African American affinity and uh, liberal political leaning. But um, there are, like, for for instance, online games is an interest which is um, facially neutral, but which still exhibits a large disparity. And in addition, um, there are the freeform attributes, which are not regulated by now, which advertisers can use. So um, uh, we looked at certain uh, potentially interesting sensitive categories, uh, for instance, females or men interested in men or African Americans, and some freeform attributes which are um, very co uh, connected to those. Uh, so for, for women, Marie Claire, for 
men interested in men, mygaytrip.com, and uh, for African Americans, blacknews.com. And um, on, in the right two columns, we show that the a fraction of, of people from uh, the, these categories are much higher among people who, who have this attribute compared to the overall US population. So this means that there are a lot of attributes which are correlated with sensitive features on the Facebook ad platform. Uh, so you can include people based uh, on these attributes or exclude them. <laughs> and now the second method is personally identifiable um, information based targeting. So um, again, we have the, the user population. Now an advertiser uploads a list of, of information which uniquely identifies an audience. So this can be, for instance, names with birth dates or phone numbers, email IDs, names plus addresses. And then um, Facebook will find matching users and show the ad to them. Now, if you, um, this feature is intended to help businesses who already have existing customer data to find their customers on Facebook. But if you don't have this data, you can obtain it from many publicly available, available data sources. So in the US, many states release voter records. There are criminal, criminal history data, and there are data brokers who aggregate and um, then sell data. And a lot of, of these data sources have sensitive attribute information about gender, ethnicity, or age. And um, so, so this is an example for the North Carolina voter records. Uh, some of the fields there, so you have names, so first names, last names. You have streets, zip codes, uh, and, and cities. You have phone numbers, year of birth, gender, ethnicity, and also party affiliation, which might be interesting for launching certain political mes messages. And um, now if you want to um, select a discriminatory audience, then you can uh, simply take such a, a list of, of user information and filter it to include or exclude people from a certain um, sensitive group and then upload it to Facebook and uh, not, not find users. So here we tried this. We um, uh, filtered the North Carolina voter records to only contain people from certain ethnicities. So the, the number in the middle column shows how many voter records there are for each group. And then the, the numbers on the right show how many of these users are then targetable on Facebook. So if you do this, then the, the selection process is not transparent to the ad platform because it does not know how the audience was created. The third method is lookalike audience targeting. So you also start with a list um, of personally identifiable information, which identifies some users. But then you ask Facebook to expand this list to a larger audience. So Facebook will, will then find similar users um, uh, as those which you originally specified. And you can go up to 10% of the people of a certain uh, country. Now, if you want to use this for discriminatory purposes, then you can um, create, again, a biased, uh, biased audience, upload it, and um, Facebook will then propagate this bias um, when, you, when it selects a larger audience. So uh, we, we ran an experiment where um, we, we tried this. So each of these lines corresponds to a list filtered to only contain people from a certain um, ethnicity. Uh, so on, on the left, you have the source audience. And on the right, we ask Facebook to give us larger and larger um, shares of the US population. And then we observe what happens to the disparity as we increase the audience size. And um, the disparity overall drops, but in, in many or in almost all of the cases, it still remains considerably high, even if we go to up to 10% of the US population. So um, you can use this tool to start with a discriminatory source audience and then scale the bias up to larger um, fractions of, of the population. And uh, Facebook or the ad platform in general will help you to preserve the bias. Now, in summary, um, we looked at three ways to do discriminatory targeting uh, on Facebook. So you can use attribute-based targeting, targeting based on personally identifiable information, and lookalike audience targeting. And um, this means that a malicious advertiser has a lot of, of options to launch discriminatory ads. And given that there are so many options, fixing all of them um, 
and preventing discrimination for all of these methods is not practical, especially if you think about that in the case for ad uh, attribute-based targeting, even as you um, ban certain, certain attributes, there are still other ways to, to do discrimination. So we argue and we work on a way to do this um, based on outcome-based uh, approach. So there we only want to look at who the people who are targeted are and not how this targeting is done. So conceptually this means that you, you have your users, you're given a targeted audience, there is some relevant audience associated with this targeted audience, but you don't know it, and so you have to infer some relevant audience and then make a judgment based on uh, about the discriminatory, whether this ad is discriminatory or not, based on this inferred relevant audience. If you're interested, then um, please talk to me. Otherwise, I'm now happy to take questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is a little bit more of a comment than a question. I'm Rachel Goodman, I'm an attorney with the Racial Justice Program at the ACLU, and we've done a fair amount of work around the problem of discriminatory advertising, um, particularly with Facebook. And I, this is just kind of a call to build on uh, Latanya's comment earlier this morning, um, and in response to your talk, that um, this, I think this space, the discriminatory advertising space, is potentially a really, really powerful tool for all of us who want to raise up the, the issue of um, the, the potential problems of personalization online, right, which I think broadly looks good to a lot of people. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for democracy and non-discrimination and all kinds of things that we want to raise the level of skepticism about personalization. And I think online ad targeting is an incredibly powerful part of that. So um, for those of you who are looking for projects and things to, to go out um, and, and help feed the advocacy community, which I can represent a little bit here, I think this is a really powerful space to look in, and I thank you for the work. Thank you. Hello, I'm Michael Schanz from ICSI. So I had a question about how you're defining this relevant audience. What if the relevant audience itself is somehow biased? I mean, for example, uh, you're, you're saying it's the people who would click on the ad, but maybe certain people won't click on the ad just because of pre-existing societal biases telling them that they shouldn't click on the ad. Uh, yes, so this, this relevant audience is um, sort of a con conceptual thing to, to help us to talk about this. So in this work, we assume the relevant audience to be the entire population in, in a certain area. So we just want to show uh, the different ways in which we can uh, create a bias. Um, when you want to go into the direction of uh, actually um, making judgments about whether the ad is discriminatory or not and potentially mitigating this, then of course you need somehow techniques for uh, inferring the relevance of a user. Um, but, but this is ongoing work. Hi, I'm Kathy Pham with the Harvard Berkman Klein Center. My question, also following from the keynote earlier today, is I think you mentioned on the earlier slides that this work isn't to either um, bring blame to one side or the other, or the, ever, the advertiser or the platform, and also not to talk about, uh, I forgot the first point was, something around um, the policy. So how um, this work like this is clearly really important. Um, and, and folks like the ACLU also doing this work, what are other ways to bring research like this really into the place where it makes a difference and causes Facebook to change or causes policy to change? Or do other researchers like you think about ways you can bring your research to places like that? Um, so are you asking how you could um, get Facebook to, to implement stricter measures against discrimination? Or are I, you talking about transferring this to other domains? Yeah, I think my, uh, sorry, the, I should have made that clear. The um, source of my question is how do other researchers like yourself take stuff like this and bring that to places in policy and, 
and law and companies so that it drives change on their side. So what are some of your models for making sure your research gets heard and seen and used? Um, yeah, so we're, so our, our uh, group is mainly working on the technical contributions uh, on there. So we, we show that there are problems and we potentially propose uh, technical solutions for them. But really the, the policy um, liability questions, uh, there we, we have to work with people from other areas and, and there we, um, we need some support, for instance, from, from lawyers. And I think there are some ongoing uh, laws, lawsuits also who are looking into this. Um, but yeah, we are really focused on the technical part. Uh, hi. Um, I guess the, uh, I had a question about the sort of definitional what is discrimination. So for example, you use the video games, like I can easily imagine the population of people who are interested in video games is very biased and so, but that's like the way society is. Um, and well, you can say that, you know, that uh, um, there's like issues there, but that's like not Facebook's job, right? And so I guess looking at the sort of outcome-based targeting, if I'm interested in selling a video game and I say interest video games, is, does that count as discrimination? Should it? Um, no. Um, so for video games, I mean, you would, for instance, use maybe such a feature as interest in video games, but uh, in, in this case, um, let me just, um, so in this case, your relevant audience will also look sort of different. I mean, if you're in a housing case and you use this feature, then um, you're, you're working with a different relevant audience compared to the video game case. So there, because of that, you will make very different uh, judgments on discrimination there. Okay, gotcha, thanks. Yeah, I think. Uh, that, brings us, that brings us to uh, to the end of the time we have allotted okay. for this. Okay. I, uh, I'm, I'm sure that Joaquin and, and Solon have fantastically interesting questions and lots of other questions, but we could go on about this all day. Um, but uh, we do need to